war crimes, crimes against humanity, apartheid. It is not only because of recent clashes between Israel and Palestinians that these terms have been invoked around the world in condemnation of Israel. But for many decades, from the halls of the United Nations to the battle cries of protesters, claims such as these have been made by those who have stood against the Jewish state, the only democratic, pluralistic, inclusive, and truly free nation in the Middle East. In response, Israel, the Jewish people, and supporters of Zionism have long pointed out the double standard of accusing Israel of these atrocities while largely ignoring the egregious human rights violations committed by North Korea, Iran, Syria, China, and others. Many, understandably, see this response as a terrible argument. That if Israel is indeed the just and moral state that it claims to be, then surely the fact that other countries have committed worse atrocities cannot be used as an excuse, and that Israel's actions should and must be judged appropriately. However, if we take a moment to investigate how this clear bias against Israel translates to the formulating of international law and, in turn, world opinion, it turns out that this may be one of those rare instances when whataboutism might actually be making a very important point. Whataboutism is a defensive pivoting argument that attempts to shift the discussion away from an issue by basically pointing to a bigger fish to be fried. Back in 2017, John Oliver did a piece on whataboutism, and since he was so kind to weigh in with his enlightened opinion on the Middle East conflict recently, let's begin with his understanding of whataboutism. Whataboutism. It's the practice of changing the subject to someone else's perceived wrongdoing. Now, what about is actually an old Soviet propaganda tool. And the reason it is dangerous is, be is because it implies that all actions, regardless of context, share a moral equivalency. And since nobody is perfect, all criticism is hypocritical and everybody should do whatever they want. It is a depressingly effective tool, which is why on Trump's favorite network, you hear it all the time. The mainstream media focused on the Trump campaign and allegations of collusion with the Russians. But what about the Democrats' possible ties to Moscow? Former National Security Advisor General Michael Flynn investigated for his private meeting with Russia, but what about Hillary Clinton? The media wants to call into question the credibility uh, and the trustworthiness of this administration. Uh, but what about Benghazi? What about the blatant lies that the Obama administration told us? What about the fact that Ben Rhodes bragged about lying to the media and the public about the Iran deal? Uh, you know, point. what about the fact that Jonathan Gruber basically said the American people was stupid? Okay, stop, stop, stop. Because here is the thing. None of the errors those people may have made in the past excuse the Trump administration's actions. In this case, John Oliver is absolutely correct both about how whataboutism is often abused in the media and about how annoyingly effective it can be at deflecting accountability. However, in this next clip, Hillel Neuer, head of the NGO UN Watch, is defending Israel at the United Nations Human Rights Council, seemingly using the same whataboutism tactic. See if you can tell how and why Neuer does it. It's a lot different. Israel has used the worst kind of abuse, ethnic cleansing, and imposing a regime of apartheid. Uh, Israel continues to exercise apartheid in uh, Palestine, which constitutes a crime against humanity, violence, and terrorism that are being exercised against the Palestinian people. These violations include uh, the building of apartheid walls to legitimize the theft of land and to Judaize Jerusalem. The separation wall is an example of the apartheid policy practiced by Israel. Israel's practices of uh, discrimination as well as extremism. United Nations Watch, how do you float? Mr. President, let me begin by putting the following on the record. Everything we just heard from the world's worst abusers of human rights, of women's rights, of freedom of religion, of the press, of assembly, of speech is absolutely false and indeed Orwellian. 
Today's report does not consider Israelis to be deserving of human rights, consistent with the approach of this council, where today's notorious agenda item against Israel completely ignores their human rights. Israel's 1.5 million Arabs, whatever challenges they face, enjoy full rights to vote and to be elected in the Knesset. They work as doctors and lawyers. They serve on the Supreme Court. Now, I'd like to ask the members of that commission that commissioned that report, the Arab states from which we just heard, Egypt, Iraq, and the others, how many Jews live in your countries? How many Jews lived in Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Morocco? Once upon a time, the Middle East was full of Jews. Algeria had 140,000 Jews. Algeria, where are your Jews? Egypt used to have 75,000 Jews. Where are your Jews? Syria, you had tens of thousands of Jews. Where are your Jews? Iraq, you had over 135,000 Jews. Where are your Jews? Mr. President, where is the real apartheid? Where is the apartheid, Mr. President? Mr. President, why are we meeting today on an agenda item singling out only one state, the Jewish state, for targeting? Where is the apartheid, Mr. President? By asking Algeria, Egypt, Syria, and Iran, where are your Jews, Neuer attempts, perhaps in vain, to reveal what's really going on, speaking to the legitimacy of the UN Human Rights Council itself. With no degree of subtlety, Neuer is pointing out that the Council is composed of human rights abusers, ironically tasked with defining what constitutes human rights abuses. And by an amazing coincidence, this body has come to the consensus that human rights abuses can be defined in such a way as to not only single out the one nation that they would prefer to see wiped off the map, but also to determine that this country's offenses are so horrifying, so inhumane, that taking the time to point out these violations is critical enough to deserve a permanent council agenda item. Number seven at every meeting. No other country gets this honor. Not Syria, not Iran, not North Korea, not Russia, not China, just Israel. By doing so, the Human Rights Council loses all credibility to accuse anyone of an actual human rights abuse. It's not whataboutism. It's not even a case of the pot calling the kettle black. It is revealing the sham that is the Human Rights Council which has distorted facts to suit the geopolitical interests of its constituent nations, while simultaneously providing a convenient means of sweeping their own atrocities under the proverbial rug. It wasn't always this way. The League of Nations, as the UN was called back in 1948, voted to give the Jews a state in the region which the Jewish people accepted eagerly. At the time, very few nations in Africa and only about half of the Arab and Muslim nations of the world were member states. But in 1975, the balance of influence in the United Nations began to change when communist Cuba fought to forge a coalition with other communist UN delegations in order to take on the United States. At the same time, a number of Muslim states banded together in order to use the same tactic to take on Israel. The communist and Muslim coalition soon realized that by uniting and supporting each other's initiatives, they would constitute a powerful voting bloc within the UN, and by focusing their collective attention on Israel, they could also simultaneously whittle away at the influence of Israel's closest ally, the United States. Today, the UN is ruled not by universal morality, by consensus, which by definition includes the world's worst abusers. Abusers who have discovered that with a bit of mutual backscratching, it is possible to pass the most self-serving resolutions. It is corrupt partisan politics on a global scale that has resulted in the normalizing of comments like this. And in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, Palestinians are essentially being governed by a form of apartheid. Now, I don't really want to go into a whole segment explaining why this is awful, mostly because it's a topic that's been covered very well by a lot of other YouTubers. So I'll link to a couple of them in the description. But suffice it to say that applying a term like apartheid to the state of Israel is offensive, wrong, ignorant, 
and disrespectful to the real memories and experiences of people who actually suffered horribly under real apartheid. This week's Parsha is Baha'alotcha. The burden of leadership is becoming so exhausting for Moses that God finally tells him to get some help. Seventy elders of Israel are called to the Ohel Moed, the Tent of Meeting. The Torah describes God drawing on the spirit of Moses and causing it to rest on the seventy elders, which causes them to speak in ecstasy. It what it really amounts to a ceremony in which Moses shares the burden of leadership with these 70 elders. And it's kind of odd the way the Torah describes the elders as speaking in ecstasy. The commentator suggests that by this, the Torah means that the 70 elders received the gift of prophecy, a connection to God that until this time had been reserved only for Moses. By this, we understand that these 70 elders were imbued with an understanding that helped govern the people, like Moses, in accordance with God's principles, completely setting aside their own ambitions and agendas. Would it be so that we could count on our leaders at home and around the world to all set aside their own ambitions and agendas in order to serve the greater good? Personally, I believe there is such a thing as the moral majority, the idea that humanity as a whole is fundamentally good, such that the majority of people can use and employ their common sense in order to be able to, to discern for themselves what is good and decent. But the structure of modern leadership rewards the ruthless, the unscrupulous, to the point that it is hard to know in any given election whether those individuals who have succeeded enough to win a place on the ballot truly believe in serving the greater good. In the end, the United Nations has probably done more good than harm mediating conflicts, addressing crises, and working towards global causes such as climate change. But it is also a governing body that suffers from its own special version of corruption and bias, to which Israel's conscience is not 